Right, so in this video, we're gonna go through the installation of a Max Van Deluxe. Now, I have never installed one of these before, and so considering you're watching this video, I'm assuming that you haven't either. The advantage is that I've got two of these to install, so you're gonna see a beginner's perspective of doing it and how hard it actually is. And then, instead of me talking about what I would do differently if I screwed up anything the first time round, you'll actually see me do it properly the second time round. Oh, and by the way, if you don't wanna hear me ramble on, there's chapters below so you can sort of skip forward to the relevant sections. But first impressions of this, it's extremely light. It was really well packaged. It's actually a lot smaller than I thought it would be as well. And just in case you're trying to squeeze one of these into your roof, the overall dimensions are, it's about 600 millimeters long. It's about 400 millimeters wide, but it looks like it bulges a little bit here. So at an absolute minimum, I would probably leave about 430 millimeters. And then measuring from the roof flange here, which will be the height of it after installation, it's gonna be about 120 millimeters tall in the middle, 60 mil at the front, and probably about 45 out the back here but then the actual roof flange itself is 465 by 465 and the back overhangs about 140 to 150 millimeters so this whole thing comes in three parts you've got the interior trim you've got the fan itself and then you've got the roof trim or the roof flange as an add-on i've also purchased this which is an interior trim with a blind built into it this is going to go above the bed so we'll see how good it is at blocking out light and this comes in two parts as well i'm yet to figure out what this one does we also got a manual a few screws and what look to be some terminal connectors now these fans come in two sizes the first of which requires a 400 millimeter square hole to be cut in the roof of your van, which we'll do in a minute. The second one requires a 355 millimeter square hole cut in the roof. Now we'll go through that whole process later in the video because there's a few things I wanna do beforehand. But before you go ahead and do any of that, make sure you buy the fan first and just double check your measurements. So this is the roof flange and is what you'll see on the roof of the van. And we're gonna flip this over because to begin with, we need to make a frame to pack out the inside of this to give the flange something to screw down into. Now this is where it got a little bit confusing for me. Now I've purchased the fan that requires a 400 millimeter cutout. However, upon measuring it, it came to pretty much 355 millimeters, which is confusing because that's the exact size of the cutout the other fan requires. So I checked the part code, which ends in 140T. The smaller fan ends in KI, so this is obviously the correct one. I also checked my order to confirm I didn't accidentally purchase the smaller one, but then they just put it in a bigger box to send it to me. But then I realized I was just being a bit of a pillock. You don't want to measure from this inside wall. You want to measure from this one, which if you do so, look at that, comes to just under 400 millimeters. So that means this bit is the bit that sits on the roof of the van and this tiny wall here is the bit that gets inserted in the cutout. So when I cut the hole in the roof of the van, I'm gonna try and match this radius here to make sure whatever mastic and sealant I use in there is really tight against that wall. So first let's calculate how big the wooden frame needs to be around this. Now the first thing I wanna do is measure the width between these ribs because this is gonna be the outside diameter of this wooden frame. Did I just say diameter? It's a square, isn't it? So we've got about 480 millimeters of room before it starts curving. We have, of course, got this cable loom here as well, so we're gonna have to notch that out of the frame to allow this cable, unless I choose to reroute it, and any other cables to go through. So if we draw the frame on here, we know the outside measurement needs to be 480 millimeters. And then if we draw the inside, we know the inside of the frame is 400. So that means that each of these widths is gonna be 40 millimeters. So all added together, it creates 480. And then as for the thickness of the frame, we probably don't want it poking out beyond these ribs. It's about 40 millimeters. So just a sanity check, looking down the length of the van, We've got a cross section of the roof, which has a slight curvature in it. We'll have the skylight on top like that. The wooden frame underneath, which will be about 40 millimeters thick. And that's gonna be about the same thickness as the ribs. And then we'll have some sort of cladding around that. And then this is the inside of the van. Of course, then you've got the interior trim of the Max fan, which will sit on this inside wall and then go up into the fan. So we'll have some on that side and then we'll have some on that side as well. So it goes around all four edges, but you get the idea. So the timber for this frame is going to be 40 millimeters wide by 40 millimeters thick. And it's at this point you want to start figuring out what joints you want to do on the corners. Now for this, you don't want to rely on just glue because it's going to be very, very weak. You want to have some sort of additional mechanical advantage in there, be that a woodworking joint such as a half lap or a bridle joint or some sort of simple fixing like a screw or a dowel or a domino if you've got something like that. Basically, anything that increases the strength of the joint so you're not just relying on a bit of glue. So if you're going for a screw or a dowel, you're gonna cut the bits of wood 
sort of around here. So you'll have two bits at 480 millimeters long, and then these two bits will be 400 millimeters long, and then you just drive a screw from the outside into the end grain. Make sure it's a nice long one. In fact, it might even be better if you use pocket screws here and screw into the frame this way, but it really depends on what you have available. For me, however, I promised my regular viewers that I was going to over-engineer this thing where I could, so I'm going to do bridle joints in each of the corners. And so because it's a woodworking joint, I'll still need two parts that are 480 here, but then these two sides will also need to overlap into there and there there and there as well. So these long sides will also need to be 480 and then we'll do the bridle joint in each of these corners. So overall we've got 480 millimeters long times 40 millimeters wide times 40 millimeters thick and we need four of those. Now keep in mind that 40 millimeter square section timber is not necessarily the most common thing to find so if you can only find 38 mil square that'll probably be all right you just want to double check against your van. But because I'm going bespoke I'm going to machine up a bunch of this CLS. So first you want to double check whatever end you're measuring from is already square so that's looking pretty good. Measure 480 millimeters from there square that line across double check the measurement and then if you're doing this by hand I've got a bench hook here that butts up against it so you can hold it in place and we're going to cut this material off. A good tip when cutting to the line is instead of cutting on it and turning it to sawdust therefore not having a line to follow cut a little bit to the side of it preferably on the bit of material that you're getting rid of. This is called the waste side this is the material we're keeping. So starting right up against the edge of the line So you can see the material we're removing is on the left, the stuff we're keeping is on the right, and that cut is right up against the line on the waist side, so it means everything on the right is 480 millimeters bang on. I would always recommend establishing this line first, so not cutting all the way through, just getting the saw planted in the top so it can't wobble anymore, and then once that top line's established, cut down. Now measuring from the other end, you can see the length is 480 millimeters perfectly. If you'd like to know more about how to saw correctly, there's a link in the top corner here. And also there's a link to this Japanese saw in the description below if it's something you're interested in. Now, I don't have the time nor patience to do all of that again, but what I do have is the equipment. So I went ahead and cut four bits of timber to the exact length that was required and then took them to my planer to get them down to dimension. Don't be one of those people that comes to me and says, oh, that's easy for you to say you've got a planer. The only reason I'm doing this is because I was just trying to use some offcuts. You can very easily buy perfectly squared timber at the store for very cheap. Okay, so first I'm gonna find the cleanest faces on all of these bits of timber so they're facing the inside. That way we can hide any horrible knots like this. And should the trim ever be taken off, they're like, ooh, that's some nice grain selection you got going on there. So we'll do those two and then see, that's nice. All right, so I can match these up, label each of these corners. One, one, two, and two, three, three, four, and four. And this component will be A, B, C, and D. And no matter how much I manage to muddle these up at the end, I'll always know that four goes there, C2 will be in this bottom corner, A will go up there, and then B1 and stuff will go here. So I can easily get it back together. Next we'll mark these shoulder lines of the bridle joints, so I'm going to get an even overhang on either side. That overhang is just due to variation on either this measurement, the thickness of the timber, because I ended up machining it down to 38 millimeters rather than 40. But it doesn't matter too much as long as it's even either side, and then I mark where the shoulder lines need to be. We should be all good. These shoulder lines were marked with a marking knife, which indicates how deep I need to cut these bridle joints. And once it was all marked out and verified against the frame, I then squared these lines around all four sides of the wood and began marking out the joint. I'm planning on cutting this using my bandsaw, and I know that's gonna get more people's jimmies in a twist. And so fortunately for you, I've inoculated myself against any criticism, and I've already prepared a tutorial on how to cut this joint by hand, which you can view using the link in the corner. When using a bandsaw to cut this joint, you don't actually need to mark out too much of it because you can rely so much on the fence to cut things straight and parallel. You just need to get a few extra pieces of timber to kind of test the joint while setting up the fence in the first place. One frame is good. Right, let's glue them.
Beautiful. Tiny bit of movement, but we'll say that's to allow for any discrepancies. So one, and then two. Well, that's a much better fit on that. So I've watched a few videos about these fans with people who get leaks in them, and the majority of the leaks come from the corner. So instead of cutting this into a 90 degree corner, I'm going to use this hole saw to match that external radius. It looks to be about a 25 millimeter radius. This is a 27 millimeter bit. So it's going to get me pretty close and then I'm going to need to file into the corner to finish it off. But I just want to make sure that the metal is as snug as it can be against that corner because that seems to be the point of failure for a lot of people. <laughs> Okay, I think I've got everything I need. Everything there for layout, everything there for cutting and stuff, and then we've got sealing. It's taken me like an hour to get just these together. I'm ready to go. It's always very wobbly, this. So yeah, the only problem I've got at the moment is I don't know where the corners are. I'm gonna have to drill up from underneath, aren't I? Ah, bum. All right. Okay, so center point we know is in that ridge. So line that up with 500 millimeters, and we're gonna go 200 that away, 200 this way. So then between those dots should be 400 millimeters. Yes. Same on the other side. Find the midpoint, 200 that way, 200 that way. And then because the frame's the same width as this, I'm gonna use that to mark the length. Right, and then I'll actually just use the inside of the frame to verify that. That's looking pretty spot on. Of course, when you're measuring this out, you could just trace the inside of the frame, but I wanted to have these two lines to make sure the frame was actually sitting straight on here. Again, we'll find the midpoint, which is there, and then mark 200 either side of that. Okay, and then I'm just gonna check the diagonals to make sure that they're the same length. So, millimeters pretty good. If it's something like five millimeters, you're gonna have issues. Okay, and then just double check against the frame. So, yeah, looks pretty good. Okay, so for this whole saw, we wanna remember that you're not gonna drill it on the corner there. We need to drill it here. So I am gonna trace around the hole saw to begin with. And then we need to get the center point of that, which is small enough to mark relatively accurately. <laughs> Don't know why I did that. Get it out there. Let's put a little mark there from the center punch. 13.5. 13.5, I think that's as good as we're going to get it. I've got to double check this. It can't be wrong. That is definitely a black line all the way around. I then came back with a drill and progressively increased the hole size until I got up to five millimeters, which was the size of the pilot hole for my hole saw. Moving up to five millimeters, which is the same size as the um, pilot in the hole saw. I've since picked up a steps drill bit, which progressively increases the size of the hole without needing to change the bit and is way more accurate as well. So I'll pop a link to one of those in the description below. <laughs> All right, so you can see the four holes. One, two, three, and four. So, just go for it, shall we? Now I must say, this hole saw is absolutely shocking. Again, I've since picked up a set of Starrett hole saws, which have been incredible. That was a little bit vibrate -y. And I'd much rather recommend getting something like that than using this one that I am, because it, yeah, it's just awful. Okay, I must say, the finish isn't great from that. It sort of skid around a little bit. So it's gonna require a little bit of filing, but let's join them up. Okay, so it's just under 400, which is fine because I think the frame itself was about 398. So let's get the old jigsaw. Cutting the lines with the jigsaw was quite ropey, especially when cutting along the ridges, as I had to kind of float the jigsaw in midair. This would cause excess vibration, sometimes it would catch, and I since came up with a much better solution when installing the second skylight. Right, let's see where we're at. I guess you can't really tell. That's hit it there. That bit is also going in. So we're all good there. But these ridges here stop it from properly bottoming out. And like, you can't really tell. If I like squeeze the frame down, I can feel it sort of lock in. So 
So as long as it does the same on the other side, yeah, it seems to. You're at spot on 400 there. That bit's a little bit under, and that's 400. That's a tricky one, that. It doesn't lock where you want it to. Well, it is what it is. Yeah, it's just difficult because you've got the ribs up here. It's never gonna sit perfectly flat, but I wish it was a bit flatter than that. Before sticking down the sealant strip, I wanted to protect the bare metal edge. And so I came back with a file and just knocked off the corners and then sprayed it with a layer or two of primer. All right, so I've now got some of this primer stuff. So I'm gonna spray all of the edges to make sure they're nice and sealed. And to make sure I don't get any overspray, I'm gonna put this bit of cardboard here with a bit of masking tape along the edge. So then this bit will be nice and degreased for the mastic. Now, it was a while ago since I filmed this, so I can't remember exactly why I stopped using the cardboard. I was either just being lazy or I was aware of the weather forecast for the afternoon and was wanting to work quickly as a result. All right, so it's clean, it's dry. Now we're gonna start applying some mastic. This is like a really sticky Play-Doh in strip form and would be used to fill out the layers between the ridges in the roof so that I could build up to create a flat surface for the skylight to sit on. Okay, so that's one five meter strip done. Gonna have to go inside to get this lined up, I think, because I can't see anything from here. Okay, so I'm definitely gonna have to run a bead of sicker flex up here because of those ribs on the roof preventing it from bottoming out. But it certainly looks like I've filled in the gaps quite nicely. It's all sort of sticking well there. But also let's not forget, there'll be screws coming down on here, really pulling that down into the mastic. So I think we'll be good. Okay, so I've just realized I don't have any self-tapping screws. So what I'm gonna do is pop the second frame over here. And then from the inside, we're gonna put the frame that's due to be here and use the one on top to sort of apply pressure from the top nice and evenly. So that should be nice and compressed there. And then I use the back side of the tape to kind of squidge the layers together a bit. Okay, I was hoping to use the frame to be able to seal these edges. So this one's accessible, but these ones aren't. So I'm gonna have to get four bits of wood that are a bit shorter. Oh, I forgot that was going to happen. Using these shorter bits of wood would give me clearer access to the outside of the flange so that I could seal it off while it was being pushed down by the clamps. This worked wonders and I actually heard a few pops from where air bubbles were working their way out of the mastic as it got squished down. I then went back with a bit of Sikaflex to smooth it all out and make it look tidy, somewhat. Then I piloted some holes through the flange into the frame below and then started screwing in these screws that I picked up. I can't remember exactly what they were. I don't know if they were even recommended, but if you're interested, I'll put a link to them in the description. Feels pretty secure. All right, let's get the screws. God, these are a bit of a ball lake, aren't they? All right, we're in. So the first thing I'm noticing is I'm not happy with all of this sealant and stuff squeezing out into it. It's not gonna be seen unless the internal cladding comes out, but I could definitely do that later in the process rather than do it at the start and then deal with all this. So I think I might trim some of it back and then just try and sort of reapply another corner of it to make it look a little bit neater, but we'll see. One thing I am noticing here as well is those screws I've just put in. Let me just bump this up so you can sort of see it there that is located right above the circuit board for this fan. Now it doesn't say to do it, but just for insurance, I think I'm gonna take each one of those screws out and put a little bit of sealant behind it, because I don't like that. There you go, just ran a new bead of silicon around it and smoothed it out. It's a bit better, a little bit less bumpy and lumpy. So we'll take that. So then we've got this trim ring that slots in there. And that would be what's screwed up into this or the cladding or whatever happens to be there. It actually says to trim it down to suit your roof thickness. But like that is, that's perfect. So I don't think I'll need to. The only thing I might do is trim down this back wall to give this wire a way out. 
because at the moment it just threads straight into the open bit. So after installing this thing, one thing I've noticed is here, I've got a little bit of buckling happening on the roof. Now I'm not sure if that's because of one, my fat ass sitting up there while installing this thing, or if it's because this frame with its flat top is actually pulling the roof down. Now when I've seen people install these before, this isn't something they've mentioned as a problem. So I'm not entirely sure why it's different for me. Maybe other people just haven't noticed. But the problem with this is that there could be water pooling up there. And so what I'll probably end up doing later in the process is screwing a supporting rib between these two ribs and then have something that could just push that roof up because it doesn't take much but I probably don't want any water pooling up there. So when it comes to installing this one what I'm actually going to do is try and scribe the frame onto the roof. It doesn't need to be perfect but just you know match those contours somewhat. So with this frame now I put it into position here you can see the massive gap between the frame and the roof here and the screws are going to try and pull that down flat which isn't going to be great. That gap's not only caused by the curvature this way but there's also a small dip going off here because we're so close to the front cap. Now fortunately with this curvature I can see that the frame sits pretty flat right until the last sort of 10 millimeters or so. So really all I need to do is just nick out a 45 degree corner on the back end of the frame. All right we've got a small chance of rain around the corner but I'm going to risk it. Okay, so now I can see that both internal corners are sitting flat. All I've got to do is plane this curvature into it. And it looks as if I'm going to need to dip these corners back two or three millimetres or so in order to close up this one in the middle. So I'm just going to scribe this marking gauge down at three millimetres from the top. That'll give me a nice line to plane back to. And then just so I can see it on the face here as well, I'll give myself a little nick on either side. And then once I've planed down to these ones, I'll curve this one and this one to match. Better, still needs a little bit more though. That'll do, lovely. Fun fact, you can actually see there's a skylight marked out on that little circular section on the roof. I nearly put this in the wrong place and if I had done so, I wouldn't have been able to get all of the solar panels in position that I'd already purchased by this point. A very, very near miss. Just goes to show that it's always worth, I mean, quintuple checking in this case. Ugh. Of course it starts raining. All right, so I'm using a piece of cardboard here to go over the contour of the top of the van and still mark a straight edge. Oh dear, this is bad rain. Oh, you bastard. Oh, I'm soaking, absolutely soaking. Okay, so the other thing I've brought up with me is this bit of plywood here. So I'm gonna use this as a support while I'm jigsawing along these because otherwise it's just teetering along the edge of this rib. Then I figured out the laziest way to apply primer. I had already filed the edges by this point as well. This is not good timing. So again, I'm just folding these strips in half so I can make up some of the thickness along the ribs. Oh, do I do one more layer? Yeah, let's do one more. One more. All right, let's get the fan on.
So this time I added one or two extra mastic strips so that it was probably about seven strips thick at the thickest point. And also I left the clamps on longer for removing them and adding screws. And so I've got this really nice bead of mastic squeezing out on the inside now, which I'm pretty sure is gonna make it really nice and watertight. My method for this was to mask off an area around the flange, apply Sikaflex, smooth it all out as best I could, remove the tape, and then let it harden slightly just to let it firm up a bit before coming back and doing the final smoothing with my finger without it spilling over too much. And with that, both skylights were installed. Now I'm editing this so far in the future that I can confirm they have been weatherproof for about six months now and I haven't had a single drop. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.